my pleasure. And I got to meet Ray for the first time when we were supposed to judge people's art, which is a horrible thing to have to do. But we made it fun. fun. We made it fun. fun. We did make it fun. But what you have to know is that Greg and I were born in the same year, the year of the dragon coming up, almost 60 years ago. And um, what was so strange, when I was conceiving of the show with Dolly, I thought of that dusty Springfield, very sexy, wonderful old song called uh, The Windmills of Our, Our Mind, you know, round like a circle and a spiral. Then one of the words in the lines in that song is, uh, and the earth is like an apple spinning silently in space. And when Gray got up to speak to the group about his art, that song, by, sung by someone else, the same lyric, was so pivotal to him, and I already decided to have that in the show. And if you will tell about Yuri Gagarin and your entry into wonder. This yes. is an astronomer artist, my great friend, Ringhorn. Thank you, everyone. And I have to uh, congratulate Rebecca for this awesome experience that we're all having. And uh, when she was speaking over at, at the other building about the emptiness of space, and you look at Scott's uh, unbelievable sculpture, you have to re be reminded of what Rebecca said, that, that it's mostly empty space. You know, it's just an incredible thing. If we, if we squeeze all those toothpicks together, it would just be a little, it's a little box about that big. So I really applaud the, the, the genius of the two artists that we've seen so far. And uh, it's a great honor to be here and to be at the museum. Uh, I am a product of the, the space age. And I was born, uh, like Rebecca, in 1952. Is that, yeah. is that correct? And I remember uh, being a child and my dad taking us out to watch uh, Sputnik over. That was in 1957. Uh, 50 years later, I learned uh, very sadly that uh, I, you actually couldn't see Sputnik. All you could see was the booster. So that was a little bit of a letdown. But uh, I spent my, my childhood being fascinated by uh, uh, astronauts and cosmonauts and people uh, with the, no the wild notion of getting to the moon. So uh, I've always had an interest in space science. Uh, but I've also always been an artist. It's something I've done ever since I was a child, just drawing when I should have been paying attention to uh, the geometry class. But uh, at some point in the, in the 80s, uh, shortly after I had uh, started my professional art career, and I am predominantly a, a painter in, in watercolor and some oil, um, I was able to bring my love for science and art together. And uh, again, reflecting on what Rebecca said, I'm always fascinated by the, the, um, the interplay of science and art. And if you think of, about someone like Leonardo da Vinci, who was a, a, clearly a scientist and an engineer, but also an incredible artist, there's always been this amazing link between understanding how something works, uh, understanding the essence of, of, of an object, or um, and science and art are very similar in these, in these matters. And I think it was Leonardo that said, art is the true daughter of science. I believe that's a, a quote from him. So uh, I was very pleased to be part of this show. And as, as Rebecca told us the story about the, the windows of your mind, um, one of the things that I've grown more and more aware of as time has gone by is the, the connective uh, quality in nature between the large and the small. And this is one of my favorite themes. And when you, when you think about something like the super collider in CERN, Switzerland, where we collide atomic particles and we, and we watch what happens when the, these, these subatomic, subatomic particles smash together, um, we see that they come out and they make these beautiful designs which are all, all spirals. And if you see in the, the upper right picture there called the, the golden spiral, you see a, sort of a spiraling subatomic particle. And also you see a spiral galaxy in the background, which is a, an enormous spiral. So everywhere we look in nature, we are constantly reminded of this amazing confluence of, of, of repeatability, of beauty. Everywhere we look, it's, it's uh, nature saying, this is how I work, this is beautiful. Um, some of the most, uh, the most amazing bodies in the universe, of course, are, are spheres, which is in large part what the show is about. You know, you think about the, um, a billiard ball on your, on your pool table and how smooth around that is. Well, that's not smooth at all. If, you, if we ever have a chance to go and look at a neutron star, a neutron star, which is 
smaller than a city but weighs, weighs more than a million suns, that is a very smooth object. And again, it's a sphere. You know, and when raindrops fall, those are spheres. So one of the most beautiful objects in the universe, in the, in the universe that we know, are spheres. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's the, the, the conservation of energy and shape. So um, uh, I love that she put the quote up there about from Yuri Gagarin because you know he was the first human being to go into orbit. That was in 1963, I believe. And much to his surprise, much to Yuri's surprise, and the world's surprise, was that he looked down and he said, the Earth is a blue ball. Now, it doesn't seem very profound to us today, but 50 or 60 years ago, this was an amazing event because, you know, what would be the first reaction of a human being seeing the Earth from afar? And his reaction was that it was blue, and that it was, it was like a bowling ball in space. So we, in the year 2011, soon to be 2012, we are, we are blessed, but we're also cursed with the, the awareness that we can see ourselves from afar. And this has led to revolutionary thinking about um, who we are and where we live in the cosmos. One of my, my heroes is, of course, Carl Sagan, who um, championed many and took part in many scientific explorations. And if you all remember the two Voyager spacecraft that shot off towards the outer planets um, in the 70s, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they were the first spacecraft to look at the outer planets close up, which are also spheres. Um, but Carl, at some point after the spaceship was, was literally billions, and I'll say that like Carl, billions of miles away from, from the Earth, he had this really cool idea. He said, let's turn the spacecraft around. Let's look at the Earth from five billion miles away. And uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the things that came out of that was this, uh, what he called the pale blue dot. And in the Voyager camera, the Earth, uh, surrounded by some of the other inner planets, appears only as a, a tiny blue speck in space. So this inspired one of his last books before he died called Pale Blue Dot, which um, I was very honored to have a, a piece of artwork in Pale Blue Dot. And this one is called The Fabric of Space. And <clears throat> it's, um, it's the lead image in, in the book for a chapter called A Universe Not Made for Us. The universe not made for us. Because if you look at the history of human beings, we were under the great delusion that we were the center of all things, that we were the center of the circle, that everything moved around us. So it has been a, uh, an amazing journey to realize that we are not in the center of things. So um, what this picture demonstrates is that uh, when, you, when you send off a spacecraft or when you ask a question, when you have an inquiry, you might be surprised as to what the answer is. So this is what uh, science has taught us, that no, we're not the center of the universe. Um, we're not even the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is not even, even the center of anything. We're just, we're just one planet, a lonely planet, lost in the outskirts of a galaxy in a universe where there are more galaxies than there are people on Earth. So we are, we are very small, we are very obscure. And but what this does is, it reflects on, our, on ourselves and we realize at this point, which everyone is coming to the enlightenment of, that we have to cherish the, the, the ball, the sphere that we're on. So these are, these are disturbing ideas, but they're also very powerful. So what I've tried to do with my artwork is to, is to um, re remind the viewer of these incredible things that we are now a part of, that we have learned. So I might do it by encircling the, an, an apple with uh, the rings of Saturn. I like, to, I like to disturb and challenge the viewer. I like to get them thinking. Now, someone very coyly said that if only I had made the apple an onion, then it could have been called onion rings. Yeah. <laughs> so bad. But again, I have this fascination with science. And if you think about the apples and twirling in space, like the uh, Michelle Legrand song, but also the, the, the story of Isaac Newton watching an apple fall from a tree, which it didn't hit him on the head, by the way. He actually saw it from inside his aunt's uh, home. He, was, uh, he lived with his aunt who had an apple orchard. And, you know, this is the, one of the pivotal moments in human history when, when Isaac Newton said, well, why doesn't the moon fall down? You know, it seems like a childish question, but no one had asked that before. So when Newton started to think about it, he said, well, Maybe the moon is falling. Of course, come to figure out, the moon is falling. It's just falling around the world. So this led to the whole notion of objects in motion, staying in motion. 
And uh, you know, we still use Newtonian physics to send spacecraft to the other planets. So his ideas were profound, but it all started with, with a round apple falling to the Earth. Of course, being <clears throat> growing up during the Apollo era when we were, we were hell-bet to beat the Russians to get to the moon, um, this, this seemed like a, an amazing thing to do. So at some point in my artistic career, I, I created a painting called Man on the Moon. And I actually um, used oh. myself as the, as the image. It's the, one, the little yeah. small one down here next Great. to the Earth is blue. And uh, again, someone suggested that the painting should be called Moon on the Moon because I'm, I, I chose to portray myself with a, with a big print. Um, so uh, I like to put a little humor into my artwork as well. Uh, the other, the other self-portrait, and these are the only really two pieces I've ever done. Uh, part of it is just using myself as, as a model because I'm, I'm very cheap. I, the, the, <laughs> I, I, I hire out cheaply. Um, this, this piece of me looking at the cosmos was actually uh, designed for a, a magazine cover called uh, Sky and Telescope. And that particular issue in 1988, I can't believe it's that long ago, uh, was about amateur astronomers. So I wanted to, to portray the ultimate amateur astronomer, and that was one without telescopes, without instruments. It was sort of the, the primitive man uh, when he first awakened and looked up at the sky and started to ask questions. So I used my, myself as the model, and the reason I'm kneeling down is because to, uh, to, do, the, to do the study, I used, uh, I used two different mirrors, and my right hand, you see, is sort of like this, and my right hand is, is a, that's drawing on the drawing pad. So I'm looking at my reflection in two mirrors and actually drawing. So let's kind of de determine the pose of that. But I wanted to portray uh, the most primitive uh, pose, you know, sort of not even standing up, you know, kind of in the, mm -hmm. the primate stage, if you will. But um, we all, <coughs> culture has depended and has been driven in large by uh, our view of the, of the, night, of the night, the night sky, you know, particularly the moon and the sun. And uh, I created a piece called Night in Today because I wanted to remind the viewer again that for whatever reason, human beings have evolved to operate in daylight hours. You know, 75 or 80 percent of the animals on Earth are nocturnal. They actually operate during the night. So we humans are, are sort of a strange breed. We operate during the daytime. But the real state of affairs, when you go outside and it's a clear night, preferably with no moon, is you see the stars. That's the state of affairs. You know, this is also what I'm trying to remind the viewer of, that we live in a very large, empty space. Uh, for the time being, there's no place else to go. Maybe in the future, there might be some place to go. But um, the nighttime is actually the real state of affairs. The, the daytime is the, the sky illuminated. Uh, by the sunlight, so we have this beautiful blue sky today. We're lucky. Thank God it's not raining anymore. Um, but it's uh, the real state of affairs is that we are a, a tiny blue dot in the great void of, of space. So um, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, to participate in this. Uh, I just I just want to go back to, to Rebecca because she uh, embodies such energy, and it's uh, it's contagious. And I see all the smiles in this room. And, and just uh, this whole place is such an amazing rethinking of what you could do with a museum. I, I'm just thrilled to be here, oh. and I, I thank you and Dottie. And <coughs> that I, is incredible. Uh, you know what I wanted to say too? Yes. Many people think that self-taught artists are you know, kind of crude kind of work. Huh. And I have to tell you, sometimes they're more complex than Escher. And to be able to show what you have done as an intuitive self-taught artist who just pays excruciating attention throughout your whole life. It's such a privilege to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much.